do we believe that we can change the world one life at a time? Or do we believe that it's pointless? We're going to kind of talk about that in some of the things in a minute, but let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your love and your guidance. We thank you for your presence here today through your spirit. We just pray, Lord, that you will be honored and you will be glorified and you will be heard. We pray, Lord, that we will learn from you as we sit at your feet that we will understand your teaching and that we will grow in you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for wanting to see us grow. Christ. Just glad to, glad to see some people back. And traveling. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Tell me you say it. That's a little late for me. <laughs> I'm already past that stage. But what do you want to be? What, what do you desire to accomplish? This congregation is mainly made up of young people. You know, junior high, high school, college age, young adults. What do you want to do? Do you have dreams? Do you have goals? You know, when I was younger, I often had these thoughts in my head. Of, well, maybe, maybe I'll become a famous actor. Or, or maybe a musician. Or, or may, maybe, maybe, you know, I'll become rich, 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 you know, famous. Um, maybe I'll be a world famous model. You know, the problem with all of those thoughts and all of those dreams that I was having is not that making a difference was wrong. It was all about me. It was all about my glory. Me looking good. Everybody going, yay, look at him. And so we have to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? Why, why do we have these goals? What are we hoping to see? The desire to stand out, the desire to make a difference, that's not wrong. That's good. Absolutely. That we're, I think we're born with that. But do we do what we do for the right purpose? You know, when we were in Galveston this summer, the times we weren't at the beach or going to restaurants or having fun outside, when you're inside, sometimes we just chill and relax by playing old TV episodes. And the thing that was on all the time, it seemed, was Andy Griffith. We were watching these, all these Andy, Andy Griffith shows. And, and there was a character, I heard from one episode, that a recurring character called Ernest T. Bass. And Ernest T. Bass is a complete idiot. I mean, he just is. But um, the thing was, in this one episode, he was trying to get into the military. He was trying to get into the army because he wanted a uniform. And the reason he wanted a uniform was because he wanted to get girls. He figured that if he had a uniform, he'd get girls. And they'd all want him. What, what uniform do you want? And why do you want it? Do you, do you want the lab coat of a doctor? Do you want the Armani suit of the rich businessman? Do you want the tweed coat of the college professor? Do you want the uniform of a police officer or a firefighter or a soldier? Why do you want it? Do you want it to, to look good? 
Impress the girls or the guys? I'm seeing this look over here. What about guys? Come on, you can be female ones who impress me. What do you want the uniform? Is it for your glory or is it because you desire to do something of meaning that has purpose? And hopefully the purpose that God has called you to. You know, people do a lot of things that give so they can get their name on bricks or on buildings. They, uh, the politician takes the photo op with some of the leader that, and it signs the agreement so they can look good sometimes. There are those, though, that are doing it for the right thing, for the right purpose. What is your motivation? What do you desire to do? Daniel 12, 3, or memory verse, goes like this. It says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That sounds really good, doesn't it? Shine like stars. To, to shine like the brightness of the heavens. But, but look at what is said. Those who are wise, by the way, another translation of that, and probably a better one, is to impart wisdom. Basically what I teach you. Those who impart wisdom will shine like the brightness of the heaven and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Hand in hand with this concept, this concept of being able to impart wisdom, to lead many to righteousness, together, together in doing this, has to be a purpose behind it other than our self-glorification. The purpose is for God's glorification. For people to truly change. For people to really be transformed by Christ. I, I want to ask you a question. As you look at something like that and you think of your own actions this week. And my actions this week. Are they leading people to righteousness? When people look at our lives, and, and people do look up to us in some ways, especially those in responsibility for others, let me ask you a question. Are you leading people to righteousness? When people look at you, are they challenged to grow? To be more like Christ? To be better people, or are you dragging them down? We've been talking about being different. But to be different requires us to turn from our old ways and to embrace new ways. The last two sermons we've been doing, the first one was called Be Different, Be Real. And that was about being honest before God and letting others really see us, right? Being transparent. Not being, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, like the hypocrites, but being real. The last week's sermon it was called um, The Seeing Eye God. And that was more about not seeing others through the filters of preconceived notions, but seeing them as God would like us to see them. The common theme of both of those is what? Authenticity. Honesty. Being able to be authentic in all that we are doing, all that we are seeing. Okay? And that is a really good base. I mean, if we're to follow Christ effectively, this has to be in place. I mean, quite frankly, if you say one thing and do another, what impression are you making on the world around you? 
If you come to church and you say, oh, yeah, this is right. I'm, you know, I look this way, I act this way, this is the way it is. And then the rest of the week you do other things. What are you communicating to the world? What are you saying? But faith, commitment to Christ, and authenticity, like we're talking about, are just the jumping off points in our journey with Jesus. You see, Paul gives us even more counsel in Philippians 2, 14 through 16. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. As you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. And I don't think this last, we're not really going to touch that last sentence in this uh, sermon today, but I think Paul was not trying to say so that I can look good but that I can look at this like you know what I did my job I fulfilled that purpose this was what God called me to do. there's a lot to unpack here so I want us to start with this the idea of avoiding grumbling and arguing. Of avoiding grumbling and arguing. Hmm. Anybody in here grumble? Complain? Kind of. How many of you argue? Not very often. Let me ask this. How many of you use Facebook? Anybody have a Facebook account? How about the messaging apps on your phone? Whether it be WeChat or, or WhatsApp or regular messaging. What about on Twitter? Anybody do Twitter? Our president does Twitter a lot. Um, lots of people do Twitter. What about Instagram? Yeah. yeah. I know you guys are on Instagram. <laughs> Snapchat. You know, the thing about all of these different social media apps, they can create an impression. Right? Because what you post, what you message, etc., tells the world one small thing about you, about your opinion that day, about the food you like, about whatever it is. And the world can oftentimes form an opinion about you, whether it's right or wrong, about what you're posting. About. They look at this, and, and if you're always posting fashion stuff, you know, I, I see on Instagram all the time the people standing, you know, you know, in front of these old buildings, I, you know, I went here, you know, and I, I'm looking really good, you know, etc. And, and what is, it's not that that's necessarily bad, but if that's all that's on there, what are people thinking about you? Well, this guy's really stuck with himself. But this girl just, I mean, she just thinks she's getting this, right? Or if you're all you ever post is about these big, enormous meals that think you're, you're, you're as fat as your pastor. Right? Or if all you do is grumble and complain about whatever you see on Facebook, then they're also going to have an impression there of you. When others see us grumbling, definitely gives me impression. Because they look at us and they go, man, that person's really negative. That person, man, goodness. All the time, complain, complain, complain. What kind of person are they? 
that can hurt our witness. That can hurt what we're trying to show the world. Now, you may say, but, but wait a minute, you were just talking about authenticity and honesty. Shouldn't we be real? This is how I'm feeling. I'm really upset about this. Shouldn't I be real? Shouldn't I be authentic? Yes. But if you find yourself that you're constantly grumbling, constantly complaining, constantly, hey, poor beautiful me, the world's against me, no. You need an attitude check. Because quite frankly, as Christians, as believers, do we really need to complain about that much? Or to grumble about that much? I mean, think about it. What has God given us? We have eternal life. We have so many things that God has given us. So why are we focused on all the other negative stuff and making that like foremost in our lives? Instead of really focusing on all the joys and all the wonderful things God's done. The ancient Israelites definitely needed an attitude check. Remember the Exodus. I mean, they, they, they are released from slavery miraculously. And they are guided to the promised land. And, and even the spies, they go in there and they say, wow, you know, there's big bricks, all this kind of stuff. But instead of focusing on all the wonders and everything, they're like, but the land full of giants. Blah, blah, blah. And they come back, and despite Caleb and, and, and Joshua protesting, they go out and they infect the people with this grumbling. Their grumbling is like, oh, I'm going to die. Everything's been terrible. You know, this is just, you know. Good Numbers 14, 26 through 28. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of those grumbling, of these grumbling Israelites. So tell me, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for. And that's what happened. Those who complained got exactly what they had said they would have, what, what they had said would happen. They died in the desert. The Bible says that everyone 20 years old or over who had been counted in the census and who had grumbled against God would die in the desert. Spies had been in by exploring the land for 40 days. And God says, for every day, I'm going to put a year that you are going to wander in the desert. 40 years. And during that time, all of those spies that had been with Caleb and Joshua, that grumbled, they died of the plague. And all of those others who had grumbled against God, that these spies had stirred up, and they didn't take much stirring, because these guys had been grumbling that entire generation died. They saw the promised land. They saw what God was giving them. They could never take it. Do you see what God has done for you? The things that He provides for you. The joys that can be yours in Christ. Do you see them on the horizon? you grow up with this too far. Does your grumbling keep you from ever reaching? If only the people had changed their attitude and really trusted God. If only you and I would really change our attitude and really trust God 
you're not growing with that. What could our life be like? Do you know what a self-fulfilling prophecy is? A self-fulfilling prophecy is you say, well, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, and, and you know, probably, maybe, maybe they'll hate you or not, but they may not like you because you basically believe that and you project it to other people. I'll never be able to pass this test. I'll never be able to do it. Oh, I'm not even going to study for it because I'm not going to pass it and everything you're going to fail. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can see that God sometimes allowed these self-fulfilling prophecies to come about. That's what happened with the children of Israel. And that's what can happen to us as well. What are some of our grumbles here? Take a minute. I, want, I actually want you to respond. What are some of our grumbles here? What are some of the things we complain about? It's hot. It's hot. We can't do a lot about that. <laughs> but maybe we can, we can stay cool or maybe that, you know, we can also say, well, hey, you know, at least we're not freezing, you know, and, and, and we can have a better attitude for it. That God has provided the sun to, to grow the crops, to make things grow. Yeah. What else do we grumble about? Technology not working. Technology not working. Oh, preach it, brother. <laughs> yeah, we grumble about that a lot, but then when we have the technology working, which it does most of the time, right? Do we praise God for that? Do we have a good attitude about it? Or do we only talk about it when it doesn't work? What else? Allergies. Allergies. At least you can breathe. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, there, there are a lot of things we grumble about. But if we focus always on the negative, we forget the positive. If we focus only on the fact that, man, I don't have pepperoni on my pizza, we forget about the fact that we have the cheese and the sauce and that we have the pizza around. Rather than always looking at the negative, Try looking at the positive. Grumbling leads nowhere good. But praying and trusting and being thankful for what you have does. Arguing is similar. And last week we talked about arguing, but it was about arguing with God. What Paul was talking about here with the church at Philippi is arguing among yourselves. You know, sometimes we disagree with people around us, even in the church. Right? This church is filled with a lot of people who are our friends. Do you ever argue with each other over things? Sometimes stupid things, right? We argue with each other. We get mad at each other. We stop talking. Well, that's really stupid. We stop talking with each other. We stop trying to work out the problems. Or if we do talk, we talk to somebody else. Right? How productive is that? Not terrible. There was a church where the congregation was very, was more divided than what this aisle and this aisle. Okay? Um, this church was divided over a central core issue, theological issue, the color of their roof. Yeah. I mean, one group wanted one color of shingles on their new roof. And another group said, oh, no, we, can't. we have to have this color. 
And they got into this huge argument. They started fighting back and forth, and people got mad at each other and wouldn't talk to each other. And la 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 la, or the shingles on the roof. And you know what they finally decided to do? They have a bicolored roof. Half of the roof is one color, half of the roof is the other color. The church has a roof, right? But what kind of impression is the church giving? A is a constant reminder to the congregation that we fought about this. And B is a constant reminder to the community, even if it's a subtle one, that this church is divided down. Is that the witness that we want? You see, when we complain, when we argue, when we're always fighting, when we're always grumbling, what, what kind of impression are we giving to the world? Who can tell me what the Great Commission is? Oh, good. Come on. I know there's some of you know this. What is the Great Commission? Go ye into the whole world. Right. Baptizing them. <laughs> We're to go out in the whole world, all nations, right? making disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of hard to do when people don't want to have anything to do with you. Right? Because the impression that you're showing is... <laughs> All they do is complain. All they do is argue. Why do I want to go to a church like that? Why do I want to be a social? Hey, if I want complaining and arguing, I can stay home. We do that all the time around my house. Right? Or I can go to my school. We do that all in my class. We do that all the time. Or my company. Why do I need to go and be with other people just to have more complaining and We are to be different. We're not to be like the world. <clears throat> so, avoiding grumbling and arguing helps in our becoming blameless and pure. That's what the scripture said. Now, don't get me wrong. Being just just avoiding grumbling and arguing will not make you blameless. It'd be nice if it could, but it's not. The Bible says there are other things too that work in that process. But it's a major step in the right direction. One of those other things, by the way, is love. Love is a crucial. Look at Philippians 1, 9 through 11. It says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be what? And blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In other words, there are other things like love. Love is huge. Love is cardinal. It's right there in the center. Can you honestly say when you are grumbling and you're arguing that you're loving others? I'm showing you my love for you by fighting with you. Absolutely. Love can help us avoid all the grumbling and arguing. Because when we're really loving people, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When we're really loving our neighbor as ourselves, then probably this grumbling and arguing with people is not going to be there. In essence, 
avoiding the grumbling and arguing, avoiding those kinds of things and loving others. They're marks of a transformed life. Your and my acceptance of Jesus Christ, acceptance of the sacrifice, He died for us, we accept that. We accept Him as our Lord and Savior. That's the beginning of the journey. He provides us with the Holy Spirit inside to instruct us, to guide us, to help us along in that journey, and to comfort us. Right? But you know what? It still comes down to daily choice. It still comes down to you and I choosing. Are we going to take that step or not? Are we going to follow God or not? In every single day-to-day -day action. Put it another way. Maybe you're in college or planning to go to college. Let's say that you were given a full ride scholarship. In other words, they pay all your tuition. They pay your room. They pay your board. Right? You got it all. And then, and then, you get all the teachers, right? You get the teachers, the instructors, you get all the curriculum, you get the guidance counselors, etc. The, the, the first, the full ride scholarship, that's sort of what Jesus has provided on a spiritual sense. All the instruction, the guidance, the counsel, the curriculum, etc. That's what the Holy Spirit in a spiritual sense provides for us. But if you had in a college situation a full ride scholarship and you had all of the teachers, this great instruction, etc. And you never went to class. You never studied. You never did anything. Are you going to get the degree? No, you're going nowhere. And all that potential, all that you could have been, all that you could have learned, all that you could have contributed, you don't have it. You don't get it. We want an instant fix. We want instant gratification. We, we, we want a pill that will somehow solve all our problems. I think we want a Christian pill, a spiritual pill. Give me a pill to make me a wonderful Christian. Give me a pill so that I will be totally transformed. That's not how it works. What God does for us is He gives us the tools. He gives us the gateway. He provides for our salvation. He provides for the Holy Spirit to instruct us and guide us along the way that we have to choose. We have to choose to avoid the grumbling and arguing. We have to choose to love. We have to choose to begin shining like stars in the sky. You know, stars in the night sky, if you ever, around here, sometimes it can be difficult, but if you go out into the country sometimes, you go out into, into the, where there's no light pollution, and you look up, what you see is this immense array of stars, right? You see the constellations, you see, you know, little twinkling lights, you see all of that, and they really look cool, right? But what surrounds them? Darkness. Yeah, this darkness is everywhere. But the lights, those stars, they're shining out in the night. Making themselves visible. Making a difference. Quoting from Deuteronomy 32.5, Paul's words to the church in Philippi call for them to be, for them and us, to be like, quote, Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Pretty well describes our world, doesn't it? When you look at what's going on around us, when you look at attitudes, there's a lot of warped and crooked generation folk. A lot of darkness. But are you content? 
to merge with the darkness. It's not what you're called to do. Jesus came to give you life and that more abundantly. Not just you, me, us. He came to give us life and that more abundantly. He gave us the tools. He said, grab on, let's go on this journey. Be stars. Don't let yourself be consumed by the darkness. We're to make a difference. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. Are you shining your light? Or is it somehow, I don't know, hidden from the rest of the world? I'm not talking just here. I'm talking out there, outside these doors. When people see you on a daily basis, are they seeing your light shining? You look just like everybody else, and you're just caught up in the darkness. We've been called to be different. We've been called to shine like stars. And we shine like stars, it happens as Paul says we hold firmly to the word of life. In other words, we hold firmly to Christ. We can't do it on our own. As we hold firmly to Christ, as we hold firmly to His Word, as we listen to that Holy Spirit that He's given us, then we have the power, we have the strength, we have the ability to go on. But it's only through Him can we do it. It's only our choosing to follow God can we truly follow. So the question is this. Are we shining as we should be? Are we shining as we should be? You know, Jesus lived on this earth over 2,000 years ago. Depending on where you do the timeline, people say, etc. It's around 2,000 years ago, almost, that he said it. How can others see Jesus now? Only through you. We are the representatives of Jesus Christ. We are His ambassadors. We are the ones that show, shine Jesus to the rest of the world. How we do our job. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love and your guidance. Thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to shine. But help us to do it. Help us to truly decide to be yours. Help us to shine for be all that you call us to. God, help us not to succumb to the grumbling and the arguing and the other things that that is just part of the world. Help us not to decide to do things for the wrong reasons either. But instead, help us to shine for your glory. Help us to be real before the world really sold out for you and really follow you. In the name of Jesus we